So with the universal gravitation, I guess this is the most important thing. The form of the force for the universal gravitation. Everybody remember that form? Everybody remember what inverse square law means? Yes? Yeah. So, uh, so Newton's law of universal gravitation says that magnitude of gravitational force is given by this expression. Uh, some constant g, this is the constant that makes all the units come out right and tells you how strong the force is. So, you know, there's some value there. Times um, the gravitational force is proportional to the product of masses. So, um, it's product, so for me, gravitational force on me is product of my own mass and Earth's mass. If I'm on a more massive planet, then there should be a greater gravitational force on me, all else being equal. So product of masses, m1 times m2. And the next part is the inverse square part in describing law of universal gravitation. The force of gravity changes as a function of distance from uh, between the two objects. And so this is the new way that uh, different from how we've been treating gravity. We used, we are, for the most of this class, we treated gravity like a constant force, mg. But well, once you are far enough away from Earth, force of gravity does change with the position. And it'll change in a way that uh, um, all of this over the distance, or I guess in this case r, over r squared. That's the inverse square part. So um, that's the biggest thing. And once you have this, then um, I guess I gave you the formula for gravitational potential energy. Um, gravitational potential energy uh, using this and uh, using the definition of potential energy that got brought up way back when we were doing spring potential energy. The potential energy is equal to negative of the integral of the, or the negative of the work done by the force. Work done by the conservative force. In this case, force, that product with the displacement. Um, as you go from, uh, I think I didn't mention this, um, we like to think of it as um, when things are really far away, that infinity far away, there's no uh, potential energy. That's the state where, that's our reference uh, state. When things are infinitely far away from each other. Um, so, you know, the way we have been treating gravity, whatever reference point I set was local. Like if I set this table as my reference point, uh, someone in India couldn't use that the same point as the reference point. Like that makes no sense for someone in India. But if I use a very distance, distant place as a, my reference point, then did I mention all of this? We might have rushed through gravity too much. Anyways, um, so if I use a very distant point, very distant stars, then everyone on Earth can use the same point as their reference point. That's the whole principle of ancient navigation, right? So uh, imagine doing this from r very far away to some actual value of r that you are going to reach. When you do this calculation, so I remember now, uh, this is the formula I gave you. The formula that you end up with is the gravitational potential energy is minus g times product of this, m1 times m2 over uh, the distance r, just the r, not squared. And um, so, you know, if uh, your potential energy at very far away is at zero, then as two things come closer, the potential energy, energy actually goes down from zero. So it's always going to be negative. And I do remember uh, me mentioning escape velocity. And, you know, it's not, it, it's good to know about some scattering of topics that got mentioned. So escape velocity is something that I can test uh, easily because, um, well, <laughs> because uh, uh, we, um, you only need to deal with the consideration of energy. Um, and there are some aspects of orbital motion that now that we introduced this, we can use this as a way to talk about things like um, angular momentum conservation. I think you had the homework problems related to this. Um, so 
all of this would be something that's good for you to know, you know, review. Don't spend too much time on it, but good for you to know. Uh, one thing that I can tell you that I won't test to you on exam three, so let me write it down as will not be on exam three, is uh, will not be on exam three is anything that has to involve um, circular motion kinematics. So anything that involves um, anything that involves circular motion kinematics, I'm going to put that on the final. Um, so you know, for the final, do review uniform circular motion, like centripetal acceleration and all that stuff. But for the exam three. Uh, even though this is one area where I can bring this in, I'm not going to bring it in. Review that for the final, please. But anything that's dealing with like energy and momentum, I think I can bring that in. Um, that, uh, that's easy, like you should remember it. <laughs> you should remember that much. Um, I think that might be it. Uh, there's, a, you know, we did mention Kepler's laws and things like that. And you know, I, I will tell you where um, trivia knowledge like those are sometimes helpful. They are sometimes or often helpful on the multiple choice question. This is really why I started including multiple choice on my exams, because multiple choice questions let me test for a wider range of things at a shallower level of understanding, but wider range of things, like Kepler's laws. There's really uh, not many ways I can test the Kepler's laws on the free form answer, but I can do that on a multiple choice question. Um, so, so I think that's more or less it for universal gravitation. Let's see what I missed. Let me scroll down. So you know, anything that I missed, it's probably a good indication that, oh wow, well. um, actually universal gravitation is not here at all. <laughs> um, yeah, it's because, sorry, that's actually an oversight. Uh, I'll try to update this. Uh, it's because um, universal gravitation used to be with some other exam. I forgot to copy it over here. Uh, I'll fix that here. So I actually remember the more <laughs> here than when I was making this. Okay. <laughs> Any questions?